All right, welcome to the program. We have an enthusiastic audience, right? Yeah! That's right, That's right, so. uh, We also happen to have some enthusiastic guests they include on today's program. These, these are our public therapists. They make us happy through laughter. We have Phyllis Diller, Rick Taylor, Marsha Lewis, and Noni Charnoff. So stay with us. All right, I think this is going to be a lot of fun today. Plus, I believe we will get an insight into some truly funny people and why they like to be funny. Formally, to introduce our guests, they have all, well, no, the two, of, two out of two have been, two out of four have been on our show uh, before. Phyllis Diller is here. She's performing this week at Les Mouches, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So she's the author of three books. Uh, one, the latest one is The Joys of Aging and How to Avoid Them, which you have done. <laughs> rather remarkably well at, I think. Uh, she's appeared in three of her own TV series, the hundreds of appearance over the years in variety shows and so forth. Phyllis Diller is a funny person, and you look more ravishing than ever. <laughs> it must be the... <laughs> <laughs> must be, must be that diet or something. Rip Taylor, as far as I know, is an insane human being. Hello. <laughs> Come in, Rip. Come in, Rip. He's currently uh, can be seen in Cheech and Chong's Things Are Tough All Over, and he just completed an engagement at Atlantic City. He's about to go on tour with Sammy Davis Jr. Say hello, Rep. Hello. All right. Oh. Marsha Lewis. I remember Marsha Lewis from the team of Lewis and Woody, right? Yes, yes. Uh, which is a long time ago. Long time ago. You were good then, and you're even better, <laughs> better now. now. <laughs> Marsha Lewis recently ended a Broadway run in Annie as the Wicket. Miss Hannigan. Yes. She's about to begin her cabaret act at Freddy's. In fact, she began it. You're yes, at I Freddy's. did, last night. Yes. She began it last night, and it'll be there for a while. And she made her Broadway debut, by the way, just a, one of those great historic footnotes in Hello, Dolly, with Phyllis, Phyllis Diller. Diller. Oh, so there's yes. friends on the panel. Also with us, uh, Melody Chardoff, who uh, is going to be my straight woman for the show today. I'm the she's, assistant she's host. The assistant. I don't know what I'm doing. You're, you're sitting there, and you're going to be reacting, just like good. I am. Uh, was the star of ABC's late-night TV comedy show Fridays. On the, that show, she portrayed characters that ranged from Nancy Reagan. Did I do that? You did, Nancy yeah. Reagan. No. To a seven-year-old manic-depressed child named... Amy. Little Amy. Uh, <laughs> this Wednesday, Wednesday, you can see her on ABC, which is uh, another means of getting alien, yeah. another means of getting television on your on your TV set other than <laughs> channel 5 um, with Diane Cannon in a film called Having It All Melanie Charthoff in person <laughs> <laughs> Say goodnight, Grace. Do I have to say anything else now? I think that'd be my last sentence for the, for the entire rest Work of the program. Workout. Let's go. Um, I wanted to just begin by asking a serious question. One, one. What are your responses to the traditional image of the sad clown behind the happy mask? You all are earning a living. And you all know plenty of people in, in comedy. What's, what's the truth that comedians are basically not that happy underneath it all? <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> My doctor told me I had shingles. He threw me off the roof yesterday. <laughs> he gave me a shot and he dropped his pants. <laughs> Go ahead, Phyllis, you first. You start this talk. Come on, tell. Are you serious inside and crying and sad and are depressed? Are you kidding? I don't think so either. Tell him. Oh. You're not? You're not oh. sad. I mean, what do you mean you're not sad? I'm not sad. Okay. Sadness is a disease. <laughs> and it's curable. How? Herpes isn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> you get them both from kissing. You do? Uh -huh. you get, how do you get sad uh -huh. from kissing? Oh, well, you kiss somebody and they leave and then you say, oh, no, no, listen, that, that, there may be comics who are sad, but, uh, well, I can only speak for myself. I'm the happiest kid you'll ever meet. You feel good. Oh, that's part of it. What's the name of this pet that you're wearing over your, <laughs> over your considerable shoulder there? Uh, Herman. <laughs> Herman? Herman, yeah. Herman the pet. Herman the fox, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, I wear things that make me feel funny and happy and, you know, I... This, I, this is the only time I shave my chest. <laughs> well, you only did one side. <laughs> Marsha, when you... It was did, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Uh, 
Hi, Marcia. Hi, darling. Hi. Hi. It's going to be one of those John Marshall. I think so. See, Bill and I, I was uh, working at the Duplex years ago. My husband did Woody when we were the comedy team of Woody and Lewis. We were working there and we met Bill. God, how long has it been? A long 1967. Time? 1967. 68, yeah. and, and maybe 66. It was, was a long manager. Time. We were just teenagers. Time. Time. Yes, just Where babies right out just of Pennsylvania. Right out of, yeah. Uh -huh. What do you do in your cabaret act? Everything. <laughs> now, I do mostly characters. I, my comedy tends to, I like to dress up like a little girl, like a little stand-up comedian named Cookie Dimples, and she tells jokes, and she steals them. You know, like, <laughs> boys are so weird. Take my brother, please. Betty he rump them. Ha, ha, ha. She does all her own drunk kids. You know, that kind of stuff. I like and that. It, it the looks kid? like... Huh? A kid who steals jokes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the yeah. Hannah Youngman, all that stuff. You know, she hears him and she grabs him. But um, she dresses up. It's, it's costumes. I, I go behind lockers or I go off stage or I, I add something and I become other characters. That seems to be my style. It just sort of happened that way. I've been doing a club act now about six, seven years. And when we did it, we'd have like a song and then we'd build a whole character around it. I have a society matron named Henrietta. Is there any and of you that comes through this? Any what? Uh, any of you. Are they all characters or do we, do we get well, to see more? It used to be all? mostly characters. I hid behind them. I guess I didn't realize it at the time, but I would hide behind a country western singer, Dallas Hartnett. Her theme was, if you can't hide it, decorate it. You know, <laughs> all <dusty down. laughs> well, then every now and then I'd sneak Marsha in. I'd give her maybe a little funny song, or maybe. And then one day I did a ballad, and then it's so funny now because this particular version of my actors, I have some characters, and I mention some of them, but most of it's me finally, and I find that I'm coming out more, as it were, than my characters. Yeah. Rip, how would you describe your nightclub act? Uh, <laughs> Watch that tone, Bill. Dangerous. <laughs> dangerous act, Rip? I keep moving, because that's how Lincoln got it. <laughs> well, you're saying both shows. I'm, she's staying, this glamper. She's good. No, I, 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 Hell's a Poppin' is a good way to describe that's my it. actors. That's I do it. everything. I wear all the old run, uh, uh, hand-me-downs, of you know, rhinestones and... Everything Can't you get new, wear, new costumes, Rip? I don't want to. Can't you, afford it. You no, want no, the no. old stuff. All the old stuff. The jokes are the oldest in the world. And I wear a lot of hair pieces and a lot of props. Visual aids, because I can't memorize too You easily. did Sugar Babies, right? Yeah, I did it on Broadway how, with Ann How Miller. was that for well, you? Well, she fell for... and broke her hair one day. It was very funny. <laughs> right, we'll take a break. We'll be back with our comedians right, right after more. this. There's more. Give them a couple of cups of coffee, they go crazy. <laughs> nice audience, really. We uh, also on today's program, I should point out that we're, later in the show we're going to be joined by the terrific. Uh, I think I think of him as a social satirist, cartoonist, Paul Rigby. The New York Post will be here. In fact, he's here. He's in the back. And uh, Bob Levine, who's written a book about the panache, is having style and the art of faking it, and how to fake your way through a lot of situations. That's coming up. But you were Rip Taylor was talking about the experience of doing. Yes, Sugar Babies on Broadway. Oh, well, I, 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 I'm finally legitimate now. I've done another play with uh, Taylor Reed for John Kenley. I did a, a show called Oliver, where I played Fagin, and I mm. found it interesting to Could realize. you stay within the confines of the part? Yeah, that's you know, why I mean, I that's, found... a, that's a regular Broadway show. Yeah, I know it was. And so were Sugar Babies, too, although it was comedy sketches, you see. But you could be loose and crazy people, and no, break... I, no, I didn't want to. I wanted to show them that I had the discipline to listen yeah. to what the director told me to do. And it threw people off, because they said, where's your confetti? <laughs> where is your confetti, by Cleveland. Way? I don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I wanted to do other sure. things. Like, this lady's a wonderful actress, but she can do comedy and drama, you see. And I want to show people... Phyllis has been dramatic, too, in a lot of shows. Well, you see, you get typecast if, uh, if they don't allow That's you to do word. something else. It's, 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 uh, everybody gets typecast. Well, you know, Raquel Welch is finally getting a chance to do what she liked to do and has wanted to do for years without being called a sex symbol. Now, I've been trying to be called a sex symbol. <laughs> All that time. They won't let me. How different, how different is Phyllis Diller's act, like you're doing at Les Mouches now, than it was, say, 
10 years ago? And I'm, I don't mean that like, you know, you're doing new material, yeah. but how different is it in terms of just your whole approach to the audience? The same approach. Same approach, oh, yes. which is, how do you describe that approach? Uh, well, my approach is that this terrible woman comes out with the fright wig and the boots and, and uh, spews jokes. <laughs> spews them, spouts them? I love them. spews. <laughs> oh, dear, is that a lovely word? <laughs> you must have been very funny before you got in the show business as a private citizen. I, wa I was, that's how it all happened. A pre a pro you were just pr a private non-pro, as oh, Variety would say. I was. Non-pro, Phyllis uh, Diller. True, true, I had no idea I was funny. I had no idea. Well, how, uh, who woke you up? Well, this, this, I had this husband. <laughs> Fang? No, 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 no. Real, a real husband. Oh. Fang is permanent. Real ones don't last. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me that, Phyllis. Oh, have you got one? I'm on the market, no. On the market? Yeah. That's a lot different. Public statement about that, Melanie? <laughs> this is a forum for it. Just stick around. We'll do our single show next, Melanie. Great, I'll be around. All right, so go ahead, Phyllis. Well, I don't Where think... were you going, by oh. the way? Well, but, but see, my husband forced me to become a comic. Did he want to get you out of the house at nights? Well, he, yes, everything. <laughs> didn't like the cooking, didn't like my looks. He, no, he really wanted me to be a comic, and he forced me to do it, and I'm forever grateful. Are you still married to that man? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Are you> kidding? <laughs> what happened? I'm not married to anybody. Well, what happened? Well, I... Would you like to be married? No, no, no. You don't want to be married? No, I'm, I'm a, what you call a divorcee. Playing the field now? Yeah. <laughs> I got it. Yes. I, mean, I want to I wanna talk to my, my straight woman. Your straight woman. Yeah. Melanie, your approach to comedy. Have you ever, ever done a comedy First act? First of all, I'm not funny. Oh. I have to say that right <laughs> All right. not, no, oh, we all accept I that. did do I did do a comedy act. Most of my I mean, I'm not a I'm not, I don't write jokes. I kind of most of my comedy. I guess the reason I'm funny and that's hard for me to analyze comes from because I'm so emotionally confused. I think you're, that you're confused. Well, I think that that's what makes me funny. What are you confused? When about? I'm not emotionally confused, I don't think I'm that funny. I think. No. Why well, do you feel kind confused today? Um, no, so I just don't, I don't even get a giggle from these people today. Because, <laughs> no, I'm I, I have a pretty good handle on it today. No? Check me later. Well, well when, you, when you were doing Fridays and you were doing the characters, that's sort of like Marsha was in, in creating. Like, yeah, there was Annie. a lot of me, though, in my characters, I think. Most of my characters were, like, s covering up sadness. I think that's what made them funny. Like my demented four-year-old, she was always victimized by her older brother. I mean, she's just always being hurt, you know? So her comedy came out of sadness, and some people's comedy comes out of anger, I think. Michael Richards on Fridays, his comedy was always angry. Angry comedy, yeah. Yeah, and some people's comes out of, um, gee, I don't know. I, observation. I gotta go to the library, because I, yeah, well, observation. It's, well, I, you yeah. know, I don't know. I don't like really just sitting around talking about comedy. It's like an abstraction. It either flows and it works and people laugh, or it, or it doesn't. But it mm -hmm. seems to me that your stuff is, is characters. Yeah, my stuff is characters, and also, I mean, as an actress, it just comes mostly from emotional paradox. I really, I really think that's what makes me funny. I'm more vulnerable. When I did my stand-up act, I didn't usually get laughs from my jokes, but that was I probably got a real laughs. treat, not getting laughs from your jokes. Well, I, no, I got laughs from the fact that I reacted to not getting laughs. I think that's well, Carson know, sort of like does Carson that really yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. I think that the way I respond to things that don't work uh, is similar to. How did you put together doing Nancy Reagan? Cinch. I what? look just like her. <laughs> All they had to do was put a wing on me, really, in a red coat, and I looked just like her. I, I, I just had to do less of myself, and just I was Just keep it down here. a little more? <laughs> yes. She's just sort of your basic, stereotypical, repressed political wife. I mean, and you can do six or seven like that. Uh, <laughs> just um, change Mrs. the hair Carter, color. Mrs. Carter just had a southern accent, and she was the same sort of woman. I mean, she's always just kind of quiet, repressed. You don't know what's going on we behind never, there, but it's extremely manipulative. We never yeah, see sure. anybody doing the, the political husband. You know, like the Bella Abzo husband, yeah. the husband of the political woman. Yes, you know, they're sort of non-entities. They just sort of endangered fade species, out. I suppose. Uh, perhaps. I, oh, I, I hope not. I hope there are more women more. politicians, so there'll be men in the you know, behind their aprons. Uh -huh. I hope so. But um, Nancy Reagan was a cinch. I, I uh, there aren't that many outrageous character ladies in politics to to uh, imitate, except Margaret Bella. Margaret Thatcher. Well, yeah, she's pretty easy. I think, I think she's sort of like Julia Child, and it's just sort of <laughs> up the same alley. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we take a pause? Do we have, do we have questions from the audience, by the way? We do? Mm. All right, heavy, heavy affirm affirmative there. Let's take a break. We'll come back and get some of those very right? questions. We have. All right. Marsha Lewis, Rip Taylor, Phyllis Diller, Melanie Chardoff with us. What, what is. Uh, 
outlawed in, in comedy. Like, could, could we be on the air today making Tylenol jokes? No, no, that's not, that's not a joke. I think, you where, know, where do you draw the line? I think uh, what we found on Fridays was with, with deaths, uh, uh, famous deaths and, and crises like that, you really had to wait a while. There seems to be like, you have to wait at least six months for a death. And uh, is there a, at is least. Is this written in the and, comedy archives? Let's see. Presidential assassination attempt, six can, months. Like, I think Mayor, they, three months. It seems to me that way, depending on the lovability of the person who's passed. Heavy on. lovability, nine months. Yeah, right. right. Mm -hmm. It seems Public that way. tragedy, Tylenol, be, indefinite right. period. Well, actually, things like Tylenol you could do practically immediately because there's, no, because there's no specific targeted victim that you know publicly. You know, there's some helpless, unfortunate people, but... I'm yeah. sure that'll be in the Carson material by next week. Do you think so? I think so. Carson's monologue to me is one of the best things in comedy. I like that. As a nightly, it's a real satirical thing. It's it's a wonderful thing to have. It's grown it's tremendously. Wonderful. Yeah. What? A lot of help goes with it. There's seven writers helping him. Well, that's I, what's yeah. great about it. <laughs> I mean, it's great. There's seven guys sweating every day mm -hmm. and he for, picks for eight what minutes. He wants to fit him. You know, that's a one minute to write a writer. <laughs> Imagine how much money they make for that one minute. Well, it's good. It's worth it. Uh, comedy is the hardest thing in the world to write or do. Could you? Could you? I mean, you're all funny people, but could you do that? I mean, if you if you were locked in a room and you just had to write a monologue every single day, do you have the ability to do that? I don't. A different one? No. No, not not. I need That's someone real to bounce talent, off of. No. Somebody but, to play oh, off. But of. they all work in teams. To ask, what do you think? I have to ask. Well, you they know. all work double. All those writers, don't. Oh you know, yeah. Oh, all, yes. They work in they teams. All, the a person in a room too. alone. Forget it. Yeah. It seems that among all four of you, there's a, a, an outrageousness. I mean, yeah. not, I mean, you're sitting here, you're not that outrageous, but your characters <laughs> are outrageous. Occasionally I am. Your characters are outrageous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of a shy person myself. Really? Yeah. You don't want to yeah. leave, do you? Uh, no. Okay, good. <laughs> you were going to say something. I write a lot of my own material. I, I didn't think I could at the beginning, and I worked with another writer, and we did it together, but uh, it mostly came from me because Which you doing noticed. characters... <laughs> Yes, doing characters, I, it's, it's from mostly I write about what I know and my characters are set where I'm from or whatever and qualities of myself a little bit, you know, magnified. Yeah. So I write a lot of mine and when, it, when you have to write it, you just think, oh, I just cannot do it. But you sit down and you do it. And like last night I introduced a new character and um, everybody thought she was wonderful. I found her very bumpy. And I know that tonight I will change a couple of things around until finally she comes up to the level I want her to be. But the hard part is risking the new one that you're writing and going through a few nights of her just laying a big yep. egg. <laughs> you know, and knowing that she is good and there is something under there and sticking and with And having her, that confidence. That's real hard. Having that confidence. But I find I, I write a lot more myself now than I used to. Uh, let's take a couple questions from our charming audience. Here is a young lady who can only be described as cute. Oh, uh, yeah. Very sweet. <laughs> Hi, what's your name? I'm Barbara Liberti, and I represent the high school performing arts. You personally represent the well, high school? No, but I'm just I'm wondering here. if they elected you to represent no. them. Okay. Um, I like well, thanks for your you. question. That was, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you know, I'm speeding here. Okay, Go thank ahead. you. Um, would, would you give any advice to those of us who would like to become professionals? Professional in, what? Well, I would like to become a professional musician, but there's many of us who want to be dancers or actors, actresses. Do you give any advice to any of us? <laughs> ah, well, the main thing is to Here it comes. Here's believe, advice. absolutely believe in yourself. Absolutely believe that you're going to do it and know that you're going to do it and don't listen to anybody in the world, I don't care who it is, who tells you you can't. Whether it's your mother, your uncle, your teacher, your brother, whatever anyone tells you you can't do, they, they, they know nothing about it. And constantly believe that you will and believe that you will. And that's the main thing. Uh -huh. And then keep working. Uh, young lady, I want you to listen to this too. It's very important, Come but I'm going to, to tell mic. you. Back to the mic. Please, very important, because I found this because personally I think maybe they may agree. Also, when you're still in school and learning at your age, take typing, shorthand, <laughs> and speed reading, because it'll help you in your career no matter what you do. That's mm -hmm. true. It's true. It's true. Mm -hmm. The more organized you can be, because you will hire a lot of people to do a lot of things for you, and that you'll find that you always do it better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what what are you inter interested in doing specifically? Excuse me. What are you specifically interested in doing? I'd like to be a professional musician. What 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 instrument? Um, I major in guitar. Guitar. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Mm. Okay. Next up, hi. Hello. 
Hello. My name is Gary. Hi, and, Gary. Um, I have a few, I have one question to ask. Um, um, I notice not only me but others have noticed that all of you here have a lot of high energy, and um, what I've been thinking is that after your performance with all kinds of energy and you know, what do you do after your performance? How do you feel after your performance? You know, when you come off the stage, how do you feel? Does the energy just fly away, something like that, or? Whatever. I find the drugs help an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say something. I mean, they won't buy the serious ads. Oh, Rip, these, these are children. <laughs> don't, don't tell them the truth. He taught me. <laughs> no, I, you got really. You got to come down because you got to go back and do another show in an hour. Well, he's, he's after the last show. Oh, Don't you, Gary? Show? What do you yeah. mean, the last show? After where you're... Any, you know, it you gotta go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, we need a lot of stamina to be up that high that quick and turn it on and turn it off. So you really must relax he, and rest. But he's but right about high energy. Oh, yes, very yeah, high energy. You have to have that. I, I, th I have noticed with, with some performers that after a show, they, they, they have to keep going. Peter Allen, for example, burns it off at Radio City Music Hall. Mm. And we were with him, actually had a party for him Friday night in my apartment. And he just, he's still going. You know, he, he may be sweated and a little physical tired, but it takes like an hour, two hours for some performance yeah. just to wind down. Probably not me. It does. <laughs> not you? No, really? No, you're not. falling asleep in the wings as you're coming <laughs> off stage. No, as soon as I get off, then I know that the job's over and I, I relax. But he noticed a lot of energy with us. I think because another thing that the young lady asked that in, in believing in yourself and preparing is to attack it with great interest and enthusiasm. And if you're enthused about what you're doing, that will enthuse you everybody around you. And you can sell it and everybody wants to help you and uh, maybe all that enthusiasm that we have when we have our quiet moment we sort of come down i, I know i come totally down the, totally bit. the opposite of what we do when, when we're up there yeah yeah we, we can have, well have, why don't we have a quiet moment now no no no, no, no. melanie will answer no. No. Oh. oh about this, this i, I was going to say that's, i always like performing in new york better because when i finish performing i'm always very high and in la when we were doing fridays there's no nightlife there's no place to go at 11 o'clock at night but here in new york there are all kinds of wonderful places to go burn off energy to go dancing to go listen to jazz and to continue that kind of uh, creative energy so i think uh, i like i like working in new york preferably <coughs> We I like go to dance. Phyllis's house at the end of the show. <laughs> Party, yeah! Let's go there after we finish today. We Terrific. Can... Good. Thanks yeah. for the question. Next up, please. Hi, uh, my name is T.J. Wells, and I'm a stand-up comedian. I'm representing a group from the Improvisation here in New York today. Uh, <laughs> I used to work there. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I used to do stand-up. I remember you. Now. Yeah, I did once too. I, uh, oh, by the way, uh, Tylenol uh, happened Monday afternoon. Uh, Monday night, we were doing jokes about it. Uh, really? <laughs> seems like there's no moratorium. That was my, yeah, was my question. When, when is there or when is yeah. there not a moratorium? People were passing them out to the audience, as a matter of fact. Uh, <laughs> no, I wanted to ask you, in the last uh, month or so in my own career, there's been things that have come up about material. And I was wondering how you protect your material. and. Uh, and, uh, you know, is it, what do you do when somebody uh, you feel has uh, used some of your Buy material? a gun. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I found on Fridays, it was the most peculiar thing. I think ideas come to people at the same time. It isn't necessarily that uh, we're ripping one another off, but we'd do things on Fridays, and the very next night on Saturday Night Live, they would have an identical piece, and they couldn't have mounted it in a day. I mean, it had to be that the idea occurred to them at the same time. So there's really nothing you can do. There is no conservation or, or uh, comedy conservation. Law, Has that ever know? happened? I mean, to oh, it TV? happened to me recently mm -hmm. with uh, someone we all know. But I did a Tonight Show, and I bought a joke from a writer, and the joke was, "I've had sex up to here, but not lately." <laughs> <laughs> and he called me. To, he, he called me very furious. He was going to really do something physical to me because I did his joke, and I says, "I didn't know it was your joke," and I bought it from someone else. So he called the writer and called the producer and the managers and the A. He was furious, and I didn't know it. But he'll never believe that to this day. I don't care. But I'm it does happen, it does happen that uh, we are innocent. We don't have to steal after all these years. But and we don't mean to anyway. Fact of life. It is. But it there is. is no protection. None no, at all. There really isn't. I but mean, you've had that happen to you. Oh, yes, yeah, of course. I'm, I'm sure there are hundreds of jokes for sale right here in this front row here today. You uh, want to <laughs> give us your number? <laughs> Thank you very much. Good. Good. All right, let's take a break, bye. continue with the show right after this. We'll be right back. Well, anyone who's been reading the New York Post the last several years who particularly focuses attention on page six could not miss the great work of our next guest. He is a political, social, slash satirist, cartoonist, and his name is Paul Rigby, and there he is. Say hello to Paul Rigby. Hello. Hello, Paul. Hello, 
go. Nice right. to have you fine. It's good to have you back. Nice to see you again. Uh, let's let's talk with Paul about what the way you try to convey humor, which is in a totally silent fashion. Yes, it is Paul's actually. I, I I sit in a room on my own, which nobody else seems to do around here, and. Um, no gag writers or anything like that. It's pretty quiet stuff. So yeah. Talk about the evolution of, of any one of you. We've got some of your stuff here. Why don't yeah. we punch up one? Yeah, sure. Tell us what it is and how, how, how you came to create it, okay? Right. Well, this is a Long Island Railroad. Whenever I'm in trouble, I go for the Long Island Railroad. <laughs> what, are they, <laughs> what are they saying there, Paul? Um, well, it was the day, I think everyone was on strike. The footballers were on strike and uh, the teachers were on strike. And if I can remember the caption, which I doubt whether I can, it's something like, um, uh, are you guys on strike too, or is this the normal, the regular service? I think it's. <laughs> I can't read it from here, but. Well, it seems that your drawings are very complex. Uh, it, when I see a drawing like that, I thought, well, gee, is a man spending an entire day on this? How long does it take you to put these things well, together? Well, uh, depending on the hangover, you know. It, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's normally, in my early days of drawing, I was always drawing this Vista Vision type thing across the yeah, top of the page. Yeah, like, like a movie screen. Uh, it was just sort of a Frankenstein I made for myself, because I had to draw a fire engine one day. And I had to draw it right across the top of the page, so we took the whole lot. Mm -hmm. And that was 25 years ago or something. So ever since then, I've done one of those every day. What's your deadline, Paul? When you get up in the morning, do you have to have a, a, the thing in by a certain time to the editors well, of the Well, I, I used to. In my early days, I, uh, 9.30 in the morning was my deadline, which was disastrous. But it meant that I had the whole day and night off, so, uh, mm -hmm. so that was fun. But uh, in New York, um, oh, around 4 or 4.30, something like that in the afternoon. It's not, not half as strict. Doing one a day? Is that yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. let's, let's take a look at another one. And it, you can if you want to just give yeah. us a... Well, gee, I don't, I don't know whether I remember. This is back, I think it was when uh, the intruder got into the palace, wasn't it? Uh-huh. Hal, yeah. why don't you give us the caption off this? Because we, otherwise we'll never know what the caption is. I think is. what happened, uh, the, uh, in the, in the uh, paper that the Duke of Edinburgh is reading there, the, the, the guy was supposed to have sat on the Queen's bed and said, I love you, I love you, you know. And, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> He'll be okay. They always that's cry right, on their first date. Right, right, no, yeah. oh, that's a caption for a different one. That is too. That's a that's the wrong one. I laughed at that no, too. That's, that's a very different funny. caption. <laughs> no, this one's no, this one. Maybe says, you could just um, always use yeah. that caption. Yes, I should. I, I could easily do that. Oh, this um, no, this one says, uh, "I, I." There was a lady sitting on my bed last night too, or something like that. That's what uh, it says. Yeah. Something to that effect. It's it's a okay. I should, I should Let's go to a specific one, and Hal can call out what it is. What the next one up? Okay. Now, we'll repeat it then. Well, it's a good thing, because he's reading the wrong lines. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how do you know which no, one? No, I know what this one's about. This was about the teacher's strike, and uh, there were no teachers. Oh, there was uh, one teacher around us. Uh, they always cry the first day of school, something like that. The first day of school, so it was, yeah. And there's two kids dragging <laughs> this teacher out, right. saying, <laughs> you know, they always cry on their first day, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got it finally. Yeah, we got it. We got one going there. All right. I wish I had done some homework too. Actually. Well, yeah. the Pulitzer Surprise one. That's the more up-to-date one. The last one, the Pulitzer Surprise. Oh yeah, that was yes. Was that today's or yesterday's? I think. It's yeah. here. I think we should do a cartoon to try to figure out these <laughs> cartoons. Think, oh yeah, this there one was the Pulitzer that, Prize. It was uh, the Pulitzer family are going through their little problems down there in Palm Beach. Yes. Um, and one of the ladies, obviously, I think the widow, not the widow, the divorcee, sorry about that, Phyllis, <laughs> has been taking a three-foot trumpet to bed with her, so obviously there was, you know, these sort of things are a piece of cake for me, really, because they just present a cartoon to you immediately, you know, the whole band in bed with uh, some sort of <laughs> ill repute or something like that. But the well, gift is to get the idea and then to write it and, and to draw it, that's very Yeah, well, difficult. I sort of, I go through those problems that you were talking about of, uh, you know, nothing's happening much for a little while, but... Then you really, I've got two things going. I draw, and I have to think about, you know, a yeah. gag line and everything like that. But I can say, you know, stop thinking, start drawing. So as it evolves, uh, sometimes I don't have a line until the whole situation has resolved itself, you know, and then the line comes. But, but does he have the freedom the to drawing. say, okay, that's what it's going to be, no, but no one will say no? Ask him. Will somebody say, oh, I don't think that's funny, don't put that one in today? No, they've never done that. I think I'd go fishing if somebody told me what to draw. Or, uh, we can't do that, but that's great that you can. I used to draw, I drew on papers in Europe for quite a long time, and I insisted that that was the situation, that you have to have carte blanche on your... And you have to have immaculate taste. Oh, that's too. good. We, you would <laughs> laugh at what but, we uh, say. You know, I, there was a few papers that I drew for in England and in Germany that uh, had a totally different policy in their leaders to what I was drawing about, although it appeared on the same page. You know, I, uh, what I love doing is getting hold of uh, somebody's political idea and then syncing it with my idea. 
Now, it's very healthy, I think, if a paper will allow you to do that, uh, to have both thoughts in the same, mm -hmm. uh, same area in the paper. Have there been, I'm sorry, no, go ahead. Have there been situations where you did a political cartoon for a European situation where you could replace the head with a political leader here and have a parallel <laughs> joke? No, no, I, I really have never done that. Oh, I'm um, sure you haven't. But no, I haven't. You yeah. probably could. There's probably a lot of parallel crises. Yeah, I haven't thought of crises. it, but uh, I don't think as quickly as well, that. Well, take it from the other side. Every, si you every situation right. resolves itself again. You know, mm -hmm. um, the backgrounds are different. and I. I used to do, I, I, my German is very limited, uh, but I was drawing three times a week also for German papers at one stage. And they asked me to do this, and everyone says, how can you draw for Germans? You know, they've got no sense of humor and that sort of stuff. <laughs> 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 but communications being what they are, everyone's got the same sense of humor these days, I think, visually. Um, but I used to draw this, and they'd send, I'll send the caption in English, and we'll uh, reorganize it when it gets over here, see, so I'd do that. And then the paper would come back, I was living in England at the time, and my wife's German is, is fairly immaculate, so uh, I used to just shove the paper at her and say, is that what I said? You know, and uh, <laughs> normally it was pretty close. But, but the picture itself was what they were after, you know, the action in the picture, uh, instead of really the uh, Paul, how did you get started in this originally? Uh, does, does one set out to be a political cartoonist, or was this a, just a, the, a sudden you, you, turn you, down an alley in your, in your life? You really the, have to, somebody has to die, you know. Uh, oh, that's Another it. cartoonist, really. There are, there are limited chances for editorial <laughs> cartoonists all over the world. So we just so could you use to wait around, uh, wait yeah, around newspaper yeah. rooms. We've, we've, we've all <laughs> no, we've all gone through the business of uh, painting and starving in garrets and things. And uh, I was a commercial artist and I was a painter in Europe for quite a while. And then um, I was a book illustrator. Then I was a restaurateur and that sort of thing. But I was always drawing humorous illustrations and for books. Yeah. <laughs> so when somebody From died, the they said, oh, let's give this fool a try, you see. And, uh, Who's killing so for the a year, cartoonists. I drew the worst political cartoons the world's ever seen. But uh, eventually, you've got to do it under the guns. Yeah. You can't be taught that stuff of... Um, it is under the gun, too. Yeah. It's the same as like we were saying. So you can't teach somebody. I can teach uh, at art school or something like that, and uh, I can teach people how to paint. And I can teach them how to draw cartoons. But I can't teach them how to sit down with an hour to go and say, okay, you've got to put all those things together in one. That has to be done uh, when the action's on. And I suppose you've got to be a fairly relaxed or dumb person to go through it anyhow. And, uh, we're, we're both. It's certainly got to be a certain type. I think we have character. one more here that we want, we want to show the football. This is a, a, a football uh, cartoon. It says... I know. <laughs> we've done it again. <laughs> no, it's not the this football the, one. That's the peace plan coming back from... Uh, what's, what's Reagan saying there? Well, the, the peace doves so coming back after, uh, after Begin had knocked him back there and saying, you know, what did he say? But the doves sort of in total disarray there, I think. <laughs> yeah. I, can we get the football one up? There it is. All right, the little kid is looking up and he says, my dad says you should have your bottom smacked and be sent to bed without supper. Hey, that's, <laughs> that's a great memory, Bill. There. I couldn't remember that one myself. <laughs> that's good. Anyway, we'll be back right after this. We're going to have Bob Levine talking about Style, panache, and faking your way through any situation. Good. Uh, with us now is the author of a book which only he can describe. It is called Panache and the Art of Faking It. Uh, he is Bob Levine. He's the editor of another thing which is very funny, I think. This would be funny to slip into somebody's New York Times uh, this weekend. It's called the uh, Newark <laughs> Times Book Review. Uh, it's very funny, very funny. Uh, it's not a put down of Newark, but it's just a, a play on the words Newark and, and New York, like, I love Newark. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> hi, Bob. Hi. Uh, Bob, you're going to have to explain to our guests, I think we should all query Bob about what he's trying to do in panache and the art of faking it. How do you define panache to begin with? Uh, style. All right. Flair. And your basic. Being able to get, get through situations. The thesis of this is that we don't have time to be the complete Renaissance man or woman yeah, today. Yeah, there's just no time. There's no time. You can't learn everything about wine. You can't learn everything about uh, the right booze to drink. You can't learn everything about foreign movies. You can't learn everything about rock music. So you're saying that to be able to fake it as if you have style. It's actually to be able to make it is really what's, what's closer. And sort of it's like verbal self-defense. You know, when you walk into a situation 
a lot of people sitting around a dinner table. Well, pretend Somebody... this is it. Here you are. Oh, okay. Oh, God. <laughs> this is uh, you've just joined this. <laughs> right. We, we don't know this man. Right. Hello. Hi. 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 Yes. Quickly. What wine? Okay. Let's discuss the wine with him. Okay. <laughs> the wine. What's the wine? Is that what we say? Or you? Or you? You, you, you start the subject. Like you this. offer me some. Say you like sit down at your dinner table. We're having you duck. offer me some wine. Yes. Would you, like some, would you like some peas porter gold thruption white wine? <laughs> <laughs> Has a witty bouquet. <laughs> <laughs> <He's half right. laughs> There are catchphrases. There are buzzwords that uh -huh. you've got to learn so that you well, don't. Well, I said let's say let's foolish. say music. Uh, well, why don't we listen to some music now? What would you suggest? It depends. It depends. If we're talking about, if we're in the middle of a conversation and I come into a room in which everyone here is big rock music magnets. Well, obviously. That's what I. That's why I brought it up. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and people are sitting around and they say things like, "Well." Kansas is the greatest group in the world, or have you heard the new Styx album? And sadly, what you like to do is sort of listen to, you know, pop music, which has nothing to do with real rock. All you have to do to shut them up, sound cool, you say, well, I was just listening to a tape of uh, the Stones' new album. It won't be out for a couple of years, but I really liked it. <laughs> I see. Put yourself, yeah, yeah, one up it's one what I, see, what I think we should do is, I think we should actually do this. I think we should just throw out some topics to you, and then you can demonstrate how, with panache and style, right? Let's take, ask him anything about movies, Marcia. Anything at all about movies, just... Have you seen the Woody Allen's new film? Uh, would be out for a couple of years. <laughs> Does it... It doesn't question. matter, I help him write it. <laughs> I have to ask you about it. Eliza, let's go back to the wrong concept. <laughs> if you're talking about movies, if you're going to say something about movies, the problem is that uh, I found myself very interested in, like, Rocky 10 and, you know, the, the Amityville Horror 11 and that sort of thing. And you wind up at a party and somebody is saying things like, well, do you really think that Bunuel's Catholicism has great relationship to his surrealism. Yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, but yeah, but that won't it, get though. you anywhere. I mean, of course. I mean, you're certainly not going to say yes. no. That's a dopey statement. <laughs> hey, Paul wanted to ask no, a well, question. I was just going to ask you, to, how, how do you say something like that? How do you even say panache when that bloody rock music's in the background all the time? <laughs> <laughs> Turn it down. You just tell them to turn Is it down. Is that a lack of panache when I said that? I suppose. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, supp suppose somebody brings up Renoir's Blue Period. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, fine. <laughs> Do you know? I know. Good question. Do you know anything about if if you, who are asked this question, and say to you, what do you think? Do you think Renoir's Blue Period was finer than anything else? What you try to bring up is something you do know. You say something like, well, as far as Blue Periods go, why don't we talk about the Picasso? It was never anything quite like the Picasso Blue Period. I see. Did and he if they have a Blue Period? Yes, he did. Actually. I know, he's oh, depressed yes. there for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> he got over it. He got over it. <laughs> I think it was his best, too. It's all that matters. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Eliza <laughs> was wonderful. Eliza was wonderful. <laughs> it's, it's can you top this, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> it's can you top this, and it's making sure you've got the right information. There's, in, there's stuff in, in Panache about uh, the fact that Fellini was a cartoonist before he was a filmmaker. There's stuff in there about Orson Welles, because if you really want to shut anybody who's talking about movies up, all you have to do is say, what do you think really happened to Orson Welles? Yes. Probably the greatest He doesn't walk in, the world. in films he anymore. He, <laughs> on, he only plays sit-down characters. He plays sit-down characters. He wears, like, enormous black tents, and he sits down all the time. Do you have an idol, uh, Bob? Uh, I mean, an idol that, that is full of panache that you've based your panache on? Yeah. I don't know. I guess not really, but I think I can think of fictional ones. I mean, yeah. I've, I've, in the movie The Stuntman, I think Peter O'Toole, that mm -hmm. type of character, is one with great panache. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's just... I don't think there's any one person, and I think right. that's what's so great about it. I think it's just simply a matter of being able to go from point to point. I think watching a person like Johnny Carson, for instance, he oh, always knows, he always has information. He always has the right information, and he knows exactly sort of how to make, draw people out and make other people feel comfortable because he has that knowledge. Yeah, but you can't go to a party with eight writers. <laughs> <laughs> and cards. You're on to ride. Right. <laughs> right. With the cards, is that what it does? I, I think this is fun. I, uh, uh, 
we had you on the program today because we, we thought we'd all have some questions about but this is panache and the and the art of faking it by Bob Levine and just quickly your comment on does this come with it, by the way? <laughs> they're the, mating. The, the, they're mating. They're, <laughs> something will be falling out soon. The Newark Times. Newark uh, Times book review. Book review, yeah. What are you trying to do here? Well, I edited that. It was written by uh, a gentleman named Tom Roberts. Uh, and he just figured that it was time for the New York Times book review to, to be, get its. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think that the, the number a, one book on the nonfiction list is of the Newark Times book review? A Bulb in the Basement. Why a bulb in the basement? Have you ever read the Shel, Shel Silverstein poems? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got okay, let's, let's take a break. We come back. I want to wrap up where you can see all these fine people. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Okay, just to, before we take a couple last questions from the audience uh, to review where you can meet and enjoy our guests, Paul Wrigley, page six of New York Post, five, six days a week, right? Six days a week, yeah. Six mm -hmm. days a week. I, uh, don't come and see me on Sunday. All right, no, there's no post on Sunday, right? <laughs> Melody work. Chardoff, a week from today, ABC, the film is... Having it all. Having it all. What kind of character do you play there? I play a protege of, of a high fashions designer in uh, the New York Fashions District. Huh? Was it fun doing? Oh, we had a great time. We had great clothes, actually, too. Good. Yeah. Good. And uh, Diane plays, Diane Cannon plays a bigamist, a bi-coastal bigamist. I like Diane Cannon. She was on the show. She's funny. She's very funny. She has a laugh that goes on forever. I know. It, you it know? It's still it's worse than, than Phyllis's. It just, you have to wait <laughs> five minutes. Phyllis, <laughs> Phyllis Diller is at Les Mouches uh, holding for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? We. Oui. A week. Rip Taylor, you'll be. We can see you with Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah, on the road, and then I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to film uh, Madam's Place by the time this is shown. Oh, that'll be good. Okay, Marsha Lewis is at Freddy's, Freddy's for, for three weeks. For three weeks. Yeah. Oh, that'll be good. Yeah. I had to come down and see. Oh, see this act. Been a long time. Oh, good. Bob Levine's book is uh, Panache and the Art of Faking It at local bookstores near you. Near you? <laughs> right. That's what they always the, say. That would be the I'll Coliseum. be the blind. <laughs> 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 All right, let's, let's have some fun with a couple last questions as quickly as possible. Hi, yeah. Hi, my name is Eric Parker, and I'm from the High School of Performing Arts. This question is directed to Mr. Wrigley. Rigby. Rigby, excuse okay. me. Okay. If, what should you do if you have ideas for cartoons, but you just cannot draw or you cannot get them down on paper? Um... I would suggest television or radio, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I believe there are gag writers for cartoonists around America, and you oh. can get into that business. I, I've never used one, but I understand that uh, someone who would give you a, a lot of guys do. You yeah. know, have uh, have an agent who's got writers who provide lines and uh, situations, and all the artist has to do is draw it. Then, thank I, you. I've never quite used it because of the daily context that I have. You know, by the time it comes in, the situation's old hat, so. That doesn't apply. It applies to magazine illustrations for cartoons more than anything else. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Next up, hello. Hey. Hi. <laughs> My name is Robert Lurita, and I'm also from Performing Arts. I have a question for Mr. Levine about faking it. What if it doesn't work? Then what? Change this. Change this subject. <laughs> then pretend but to be like, a comedian. How? <laughs> change the subject. Give me an example. I mean, it invariably um, works. I don't know. Uh... You have little basic pieces of information, and that's what you try to work on. I mean, there's no possible way that you can, you can uh, invent an entire situation. Presumably, you'll have some kind of a link in with what's going on, and then you can just work it from there. Okay, thank you. Sure. You believe that? <laughs> <laughs> Next up at the mic. <laughs> Hello, my name is Cleo Hall, and I'm also from Performing Arts. And my question is to Mr. Rigby. In your cartoons, I noticed that you hide a little boy and a little dog in your picture. That's right. I want to know if that's a trademark or a sign of yours, you know. Well, it's become a sort of a Frankenstein. Yes, it's a trademark. It's been going on for a lot of years. And uh, we ran a little competition recently. Because I didn't run it. It was uh, the city editor that ran it. But uh, I had this pretty crowded scene. And I hide this little dog and the boy I have done all the time. So he decided they'd run a competition for a hundred bucks who could find the boy and the dog in this cartoon. We got 55,000 entries, <laughs> all right, I think. And we only had 100 bucks, you know, so I had to put my hand in a bag and uh, pull somebody's name out, and that was the one that got the hundred dollars. But um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people didn't realize there was a boy and dog there before this competition. Now I'm still getting letters thinking they think it's a competition every day now, you know, and uh, that's caused quite a Frankenstein situation for me. 
but it is uh, a trademark that's been going on for a long time, yeah. Thanks, Cleo. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, you're a wonderful audience. I think that, that it was much more fun for us that, of having you here than if we had had, say, no audience or... <laughs> <laughs> Or normal people. Perhaps, or normal people, or even some of the other audiences we've had. You know, the ones that come from the Valiant Clinic. They're cute. I thank you. You're a terrific audience. Uh, and if you would like, uh, I suggest that tomorrow you turn on the show, because tomorrow we're going to be live. We have Harry Reams, one of the most notable of all porno stars. And he's going to be facing off uh, against... Uh, with Women Against Pornography. Ooh. Ooh. Live tomorrow. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs> Bye -bye.